It is now my honor to introduce our distinguished uh, speaker, Bob Lorber. Bob's a colleague, he's a friend, he's a supporter of the, the school um, in many ways. Um, and, and I was telling Bob uh, coming in uh, that I, it was hard for me to think about what role he has in played because he's been a faculty member, uh, chair of the Dean's Advisory Council. He's he won our uh, our Distinguished Service Award. He's I mean he's he's done everything but be dean. And then I said, "Ooh, I've got a job for you." <laughs> he declined, and I don't know why. <laughs> but he, uh, Bob has served has served us in so many ways. Um, he is president and CEO of Lorber Kamai Consulting Group, which he started uh, 30 years ago. And his clients are incredibly impressive uh, group of people, um, uh, from mid-sized to Fortune 500 companies um, on five continents. This guy knows about uh, frequent flyer miles, um, including Kraft Foods, Mattel, Gillette, um, uh, area firms like uh, Sutter Health, uh, Tiger, and Pride. And uh, he's one of the world's leading uh, resources on executive coaching. Um, uh, he, he's helped some of those uh, the CEOs facing big issues get, get through those. And we've, um, we've, had very, we've been very fortunate in having Bob teach leadership courses to our students and often bringing, uh, bringing luminaries to our, uh, to our classrooms. And I, I, don't, I know you've all been reading the Wall Street Journal about the problem Mattel's had with uh, um, lead content in toys. Um, Bob uh, uh, was able to uh, get um, Bob Eckert, the CEO of Mattel, to come speak uh, what, two or three weeks ago. I was sure he wouldn't come given, given all the fact that he's running to Congress and uh, his shareholder meetings, but he came and spoke to the uh, MBA students and, uh, and it, it, Bob's connections uh, made that possible for our students. And so uh, he, re he brings great value to our school and as well as a, um, a, a fun and kind demeanor. Um, I, uh, I better, I better uh, move on here. He is, uh, he is actually an author of a number of books, uh, including the New York Times bestseller, Putting the One Minute Manager to Work, uh, One Page Management, and Safety 24-7. But we're here to hear, learn about his new, new book, Doing What Matters, which he co-authored with John Manfredi and the former Chief Executive Officer of Gillette, Jim Kiltz. Um, the book features uh, a forward by Warren Buffett. So it's, it's highly recognized as having important, important content. And he is going to sign uh, copies um, after his presentation. So you, uh, if you're interested, um, Bob will, will stay on. Um, Mike Ziegler probably doesn't need to be uh, introduced. He's one of the most widely recognized figures in our community. Uh, he's a great... All right, this is Mike Ziegler, <laughs> who will now Hi, introduce everybody. himself. <laughs> Yay, Mike. <laughs> He's, uh, Mike really does represent the kind of success that Bob's uh, book uh, talks about. And he was a perfect, uh, perfect person to, to partner with Bob and, and ask questions, the kind of questions you would want to ask uh, Bob about his book. So we, we asked him to do that, and he very graciously agreed. Um, Mike is, of course, the um, the CEO of Pride Industries, an amazing success story, and uh, something that uh, um, uh, this community is very, very proud of. It's made a huge, talk about making a difference in people's lives. Pride certainly embodies all of that. So, thank you for coming, and thank you to our speakers. And I'm going to turn it over to them. You want me to start, or do you want to start? Morning, everybody. Hey, happy Thanksgiving, right? <laughs> you know, on, uh, for all of us, on our worst day, don't we have a lot to be thankful for? Think yeah. about it. Right, so happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Uh, uh, Bob asked me to be the moderator this morning. Uh, uh, Bob and I have been friends for many, many years. What I would tell you, you know, this, he's a PhD, right? So yeah. he gets made fun of a lot of times for being a PhD. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, in my career, I have yet to meet anybody, and I, I accuse Bob of this all the time, with my tongue firmly in my cheek, I say, he, he can do, he can help companies, he can sleepwalk and help companies, because he has a lifelong, uh, just a lifelong training on asking the right kind of questions. He, this guy will ask me questions. 
He's worked with me for years at Pride. Ask me questions that, uh, um, you know, you have to answer. So, th- th- that are very difficult to answer, and that when you answer them, you become a better person, your company becomes a better company. So, I, I have a, uh, uh, I'm a raving fan of Bob's. On the way down here, I was thinking, though, this is a, he's talking about his new book, Doing What Matters. If this was existentialist, what would anything matter? <laughs> so with all that said, <laughs> if you know about Gillette and the last five years of Gillette during Jim Kilt's leadership there, Gillette went from an $8 billion top-line revenue company to an $11 billion company. It's, it's Profit went from $1.7 billion, this is in five years, $1.7 billion to over $3 billion. It's earnings per share for you uh, public company freaks. Uh, earnings per share went from $0.99 cents a share to, I think, two oh nine a share. And it doubled its invest, uh, money spent on, on um, capital improvements, doubled the return for the company during Kiltz's tenure. So this is a pretty special guy. Bob was there the entire time helping him. And, and, and Kiltz talks freely about his use of consultants. So I, the first question I would have for Bob is, um, you know, how did you meet Jim? Uh, and how did you get him to write a book? <laughs> so I guess what we're going to do, by the way, is I know you had asked about the slides. Are you going to answer that question? Um, I, I am. <laughs> I am. You can see how this. Is. We got what forty minutes left, so I'm going to oh, yeah. try to, <laughs> try to answer the try question. To your time. So I know that you wanted us to do the slides first. We're not. We're going to start with with the dialogue with Mike, which I think will be more interesting. I'll spend a few minutes on some of the slides. Um, most of the information is in the book, so please buy buy lots of copies of the book. Jim will be happy. Um, the the fun though, and a question my mom asks is, where's your name on the book? Um, um, where? Let's see. Can you see it? <laughs> the important thing is I own a third. <laughs> I do own a third. Um, let me get to Mike's question, and then there's, there's a few things I'd like to share with you this morning. Um, I met Jim in 1989. Jim was the president of Kraft USA, um, right after Philip Morris had purchased Kraft. Um, I actually was in there working with the head of worldwide operations, working on performance and productivity, which for most of my business career was my passion, you know, how to really improve performance and productivity inside of companies. I was working with a gentleman who reported to him by the name of Dick Bailey, who ultimately became uh, CEO of Dean Foods, um, working with his leadership team. Jim came in one day and heard some of the things we were doing and said, you're not working for Bailey anymore, you're working for me. And if you know Jim, that's how Jim, and you, know, you just go, yes, sir. Um, anyway, um, I worked with Jim through all the years at Kraft. Then he went to Nabisco. And then we re- reconnected when he went to Gillette. Um, after all the, during the years at Gillette, I went to him one day and I said, Jim, um, I know you're, you're he, he's, believe it or not, is a fairly low, was a fairly low profile, not a big ego guy. So here's a guy who ran Kraft. Nabisco and Procter and Gamble, and I said, "You have so many concepts that are so valuable. Um, I really believe that you need to get those out there um, in your career and leave a legacy." The second piece of it was, of all the people that worked for Jim, he built a team of people that turned into this team extraordinary. You met, we brought uh, Bob Eckert here, CEO of Mattel. Rick Lenny was here last year, as you know, and he also came last week to speak to my students, who is the CEO of Hershey, um, CEO of Campbell, Sears, um, my gosh, Quaker Oats, uh, um, Bob Morrison, uh, the list goes on and on. And of these 15 vice presidents I work with, every single one of them became a CEO. And I said, Jim, there's a story here. There's something really important to get out. He said, no, I'm not interested in books. This went on for a long time. He'd had about, I think he told me, about 500 people who had tried to do a book. Um, with him. And one day I was in, with Ken Blanchard in San Diego and the phone rings at 6 o'clock in the morning and Jim, uh, in his classic fashion, said, I've decided to do a book, so get started. <laughs> that was it. And so that's kind of, that, that is Jim Kiltz, if you, I mean, a, a wonderful man, but the person in charge and a great leader. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I, as I said, I would love to share some concepts with you once Mike and I get a little bit through some of our bantering. So what's your next question? <laughs> Why don't you describe Jim's leadership style? Um, 
Joan, do you remember what Peter said the other day? <laughs> say, Joan, that's Joan Mazak over there, who's the head of organizational effectiveness at Rayleigh's, one of our other great companies in the area. And that's her husband, I think. <laughs> never met him. Um, Jim's leadership style is um, one of extreme passion for what he does, incredibly focused on data, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit. Um, incredibly focused on building a high performance, you know, things that, again, that seem so obvious. But Jim is an executor. Um, Jim is a person of not a lot of words, not a lot of paper. Those of you that, that get a chance to look at uh, Doing What Matters or buy one and pass it around, um, has a tremendous ability to focus on the right things. So when we talk about doing what matters, it's because that's, Jim, that's how Jim lives his life. So when he, is, is, when he first starts working with a leadership team, and, and we, we put this in doing what matters, uh, his first 100 days is absolutely extraordinary. And the first day, the thing that he does is sits down with the leadership team and basically says, here's my style and how I operate. Here's my philosophy. And here's my expectations of you. That is day one with the leadership team. And then reverses that and says to the team, what do you need from me? And that's the beginning of his working relationship with the team. Now, his focus when he starts working um, as a leader is, is, let me give you a couple of key areas, which is really where I started working with him. The first thing that Jim does is a huge amount of research on the company. He's a turnaround um, CEO. So his research, his data, which he gets mostly from public information, and he winds up knowing more about the company than people sitting in the room. And I think we talked about that in some, some great deal, detail in the book. But the, the things that he does in the beginning is get real clear about what the culture is and what he would like it to be. And it starts out with a clear sense of, part, this, this is something you write. Those of you note takers, this is some really brilliant stuff that's not in the book. The first, it is brilliant. You said I was. I've never known you to be pompous. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the first brilliant, yes. Yeah. Pompous, no. Go. Clear sense of purpose, okay. Which is you all, all of you in, in working in your businesses, family business, small business, large business, is getting a clear sense of purpose, and that's the whole thing about vision, that you have a real clear sense of what you, what you're where you're going. My favorite analogy of that is in 1980. When did Peter you brought through the Olympics in, in LA? It was 84, 84, 1984. I volunteered to to serve water on the marathon line um, at the Olympics. And, and you brought did a phenomenal job. Um, actually, he's one of the people being considered for time person of the year. I remember right, I just, just happened to see that. Anyway, I went up to a place in Orange County called Cota de Casa, um, which is in South Orange County. And I went to see the archers. And the archers were standing there like this. They had um, a, a, a pretend bow, a pretend, pretend quiver, and a target. And they're just going like this. So I went up to the coach and I said, what are they doing? You know, aren't they supposed to be shooting arrows at the target? He said to me that if they get a clear picture of that arrow going into the bullseye, their vision of it, it increases the odds of them getting more bullseyes. And that's what Jim understands, which is a clear sense of vision. And then the passion, when he's leading that, is it is repeated over and over and over. He travels all over the world, meets with every team, going over that vision and what we're all about. The second thing is their data system. So if you've got clear accountability, the second piece is Jim is obsessive as a leader about having good measures. So as they pick the three to five key things that they're working on, they are obsessive about the metrics. There's only four things you can measure in, a, in an organization. Quantity, how much, quality, how good you're doing, cost, on or off budget, and timeliness. And there's a lot of stuff about um, cost in the book, which is Jim calls Zog, zero overhead growth, and you know, again, some pieces that you can read about on your own. But the, the, the passion and obsession of a leader to measure the performance. The third piece, so if you've got clear purpose, you've got a clear sense of measures, the third piece is how Jim manages performance. And the way he manages performance is through a you know, model that, that Mike's heard me talk about a number of times. I'll just kind of quickly go through it with you. And the way I always like to talk about it is if you stepped outside your businesses right now, and you said I was going to evaluate our business, here's how I would look at it. Number one, accountability. Does everybody really know what they're responsible for? If I report to Mike and Mike says to me, Bob, I want you to write down all the things you're responsible for. 
Mike sits over here. He writes then all the things that I'm responsible for. Compare the lists. It's the most powerful thing you could do to get clear accountability. The second thing that Jim does is, okay, we got that list, but now let's talk about the priorities. Great, uh, my favorite story of, of, um, of, of, of priorities is in, I don't know what year it was, in San Diego, I was working with a wonderful CEO by the name of Red Scott. And Red had a company which was a conglomerate. And one of the, conglom one of the um, places had a place that sold plants, you know, kind of like a nursery land kind of place. I asked him what's the most important thing that people do in the, in the stores. He said, without question, greet the customer and help them buy the right plant, because one of our issues is return. You know, people buy plants, put it in the shade, they belong in the sun. You know, so real clear. And, and again, Jim understands this aspect of brand management. I went to the store in Laguna Beach, wandered around the store. Um, nobody came near me. Finally got in a conversation with a young man. I said to him, what's the most important thing that you do here? In this, in the store, he said, "Keep the floors clean and the shelves stocked." Okay, is that important? Absolutely. You don't want to go to Jennifer's, you know, Davis Lumber and see stuff all over the floor. But what's the? But look at the difference in the priority. The customer is standing around. Nobody's coming near them. Anybody been in a Sears lately and try to get help? You know what I'm talking about? I embarrass the Dickens out of my wife Sandy. I start screaming, "Help! Help! Help!" So I can get out. So I can pay. <laughs> but what happened is um, that. That real prioritizing that if you say customer services first, then look at the behavior. And that's one of the things that Jim understands. Clear accountability data systems, um, underperformance accountability data. The third is feedback. We talk a lot about feedback, that people need a lot of feedback about performance and how do you get that into the system in a real timely manner. Fourth thing, Jim, is uh, at which it, it's almost hard to imagine because he's, he's a very stiff, direct, um, not someone you go in and you sit and schmooze with. The, the mo Every time I would meet with him, um, what I, I, I would go in there, I'd schedule 20 minutes, and I'd be out of there in 15. You know, his, com his, his philosophy is don't waste paper and don't waste time. So let's go right to the point. This is not about schmoozing, and it's not about having a love fest. So clear accountability. So, so where I am in terms of stepping outside, accountability, data, feedback, recognition. That within the system that you have, there's tangible and intangible recognition, look at those. Fifth thing Jim is obsessive about is making sure there's training going on at all levels in the company. Technical and managerial. That people have got to have the skills and he hires the right skills and if they, if, if they hire people with potential, we make sure that they have the skills. Last two things are communication. Jim is obsessive about communication throughout the, and then how we build teams. So we've got purpose, we've got um, decision making, Accountability, data, feedback, recognition, all fit under performance. And, and I'll, I'll just stop right there so Mike can feel like he's doing something productive because I can go on for the rest of the morning. <laughs> Mr. Z Sorry, Mr. Ziegler, go ahead. Hello. Oh, buddy. We haven't rehearsed well, I, this, I, I, as you can tell. I'm thinking about right. everything you said. And, and having read the, the, that book, the, the thing about accountability. So what popped out at me was when Kilts got to the company, uh, his manager, the company was underperforming. His managers were being rated overall. Uh, overall, they were being rated Fudge. meet and exceeds on their on their performance evaluation. Mm -hmm. He put in a different kind of evaluation system, a one to one hundred score, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And so I got the feeling that people in the company, there's a couple things that come out when you talk. First of all, he did this in five years. I would question whether what he did is sustainable. If anybody could continue to do that successfully, that would be one question. <laughs> I don't have a clue. Yeah, I, 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 I know that. And, 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 but the other thing is the accountability. How do people feel who work for him about that accountability? Um, at first, tremendous resistance. Um, as, as you look at doing what matters, did, uh, pardon? Oh, I thought somebody asked a question. Um, tremendous resistance at first. Um, Again, as I mentioned to you, when Jim comes in and talks about expectations and how he's going to work, um, here are very senior people that are about to sit down in a system where he, they're going to be graded on a quarterly basis, intense grading. And people go, well, you know, wait a minute, time out. You know, I did this in, you know, in high school. Well, uh, I'm sorry, one other question. Did he force, did, did he force rank people? I, I didn't get that. Did he force rank them? No, no, no. There were, there, it was not a force ranking in terms of here's the top. And so everybody the, could get 100? Everybody could get 100, okay. um, which you never did. Um, one, one of the, the, well, I mean, here's one of the things that, again, we talked about that Mike just clicked in. Uh, they had a tremendous human resource, a male version of Joan Mizak. 
um, within, um, within Gillette. And his name actually was Ned Gillette, G-U-I-L-L-E-T-T, and was, was at Gillette for 30 years. When Jim first came in, you know, everybody thought they were going to be fired um, on the senior team. You know, here comes the new CEO. Here comes, you know, so who's going to stay? Everybody had a chance to stay. When he asked the team about performance, and they, and they looked at performance evaluation throughout the company, most, he, uh, most of the people were being ranked four or five. You know, you have a, a, a grading scale of, you know, your four or five, uh, one, two, three, four, five. And the performance of the company was not commensurate, you know, without, without getting too, in, into too much of the details. And what they changed in the performance system is that a three means meets performance. And so here's all these people at fours and fives, and they're not making, making their numbers, and they're not making the data. And Jim's saying, how, you know, how do you reconcile this? So they changed the whole evaluation system to where three was outstanding performance. I mean, it was meeting performance. Fours or fives were, were very rare, which is ex exceeds performance. And again, I, I think we talked about this in detail. The other thing which, which Mike is talking about is Jim meets one-on-one -on -one with all of his direct reports, and they are ranked up to 100%. And they rank themselves, and he ranks them, which is the part that gets tremendous amount of resistance. But it's not an option. Jim is obsessive about following up on the data and performance. So I'll leave it at that. Mike. You know more about it. And Mike met. Um, Mike. Mike came with me. I had dinner Jim. with Jim Kiltz sitting and, next, mm -hmm. and that is a scary human being. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's everything, Bob. You know, when Bob talks about Jim, this is a, a obviously a you know a very bright. Right, uh, man, <laughs> but he's like a machine. Tell him the first time that you went, we went to Boston. Mike, Mike and I are in this uh, CEO group together. And so I set up a meeting for all of us to go back to Boston, meet the senior team at Gillette, and meet in the boardroom. So in walks Mr. So, Ziegler. <laughs> so, we've, uh, so, so this is cool. We're all feeling like we're pretty hot stuff. We're in Gillette's boardroom, this beautiful boardroom, if you can imagine where the board of directors sit. And uh, Peter Klein, who was the head of strategy for Gillette, um, uh, uh, welcomed us. And this Ned Gillette welcomed us. Ned Gillette, by the way, uh, head of HR for uh, Gillette at the time, uh, was an ex-professional ex football player, larger than life character, incredibly talented human being. When these guys talk, they talk about HR being so very, very important in all of our companies. Uh, I think everybody knows that. But this, this, this Ned Gillette, uh, is recognized probably in the world as one of the best HR professionals in the world, which is kind of cool. So here we are. We're in the boardroom, this beautiful light blue boardroom. We're all dressed up because we were told to wear suits and ties to come visit Gillette and be in the boardroom. And Peter Klein says, uh, you know, sit anywhere you want around this oval table, this huge oval table. So I put my jacket on the back of a chair in kind of a this corner of the oval, if the head of the oval is here, I'm over here, kind of being unobtrusive, put my jacket down, go get some coffee. And Peter Klein goes, whose jacket is that? <laughs> Let's let this be interactive. Whose jacket do you think it was? <laughs> so anyway, so I go, I go, it's mine. And he goes, well, I just want you to know, when Warren Buffett is in the boardroom, that's where he sits. And just to know how all of us CEOs, because this was a CEO group of people, I'm pride at 150 million bucks. We were this. I'm the smallest company in this group. So these are some impressive CEOs, right? Every one of us sat in that chair, went like this in that chair. So that's where Warren Buffett sat. That's my uh, Gillette. That's my Gillette boardroom story. I hope that added value to your morning. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. What am I talking Bob, about? Oh, okay, here's what else. Here's a question, in keeping, with the, in keeping with the time. Yes. Keeping the times that we're in right now. Yes. What side of the turkey has the most feathers? <laughs> Mr. The, PhD. What, the bottom side. The outside. Oh, that was close. <laughs> that, is that a real question? But they only have till 9 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how does Jim enter? You, I, I, you covered this, but I, I think there's a real knack. When somebody of Jim's stature comes into a company, He's known as a turnaround specialist. How do people within the company react? Not just the executive, everybody. Um, tremendous fear. Um, and and how does um, that play out? Um, it plays out with a, a huge amount of dialogue going on in, inside the company. Um, and the, the, the other part of it, again, remember, Jim is known as a turnaround 
CEO, and there's very different skills. You know, that's why Mike's question about sustaining, and I, I, I don't know the answer to that because in, um, in the Nabisco case, and of course in, in however you evaluate um, this whole merger acquisitions thing, and Mike's got some strong opinions about that as well, you know, sold um, uh, Gillette to Procter and & Gamble. Um, and, you know, the returns of the shareholders was extraordinary, and then there's a lot of conflict about, you know, CEO compensation these days, and Jim was paid extremely well. A lot of conflict with inside of, with inside of Boston as, um, you know, Procter & Gamble took over. Jim's um, communication style is one of getting involved at every level very quickly. So as he talks within his team, and there is all this fear that's going on, which is who's going to lose their jobs, and there are going to be, because the cons when Jim comes in, there, are, there is going to be consolidation. And as we write about, this whole zero over at growth comes from um, you know, the loss of employees. Um, and how he does that, I, I hope we described it well, and Mike has some. So, so there is a tremendous amount of fear, but those that are high performers are really excited because they know the reputation with which he comes in. And the other thing that, as I mentioned, that he does is he does so much homework on the company, and he has so much passion for the business that he goes into, and, and actually a real love you know, for brands, and, and, and as I said, you know, you know, the craft, all the brands that Kraft has, all the brands that Nabisco has, you know, so he came in with a tremendous passion about Gillette, and also he came in as the first outside CEO in that company in seven years. So the company has this huge history, and here comes this person from the outside, and that's why, to Mike's question, there's a huge amount of fear, and the first thing Jim does is bring this whole senior management team together, figure out how they're going to work together, and then that's how that's going to it be indoctrinated throughout the world. And remember, at Gillette, 60% of the company is international. You know, so it's a tr tremendous challenge to, in the terms of the communication processes in every country throughout the world about who's this guy, what's going to happen, do I still have a job? And Jim very quickly gets into the communication aspects of it, video-wise, traveled extensively. Um, and so that's, you know, that's... I, I have another question. The yes. people, you know, here's a hard-driving hard -driving person to work for to work to report directly to yes so so I've met a lot of people who report to him mm -hmm. directly mm -hmm. and I have my own feeling you probably have a better feeling mm -hmm. so I'm sure they all respect him because it would no be question. hard not to yes do they like him oh this is being videotaped um, oh. yeah I <laughs> yeah it's yeah. oh gosh my liar I love you <laughs> um, it's mixed. I mean, I think they do. I didn't get um, that. I didn't get that feeling. Um, and this is being fitting. It, well, it's it, again, it's not a love fest. It is about performance. Jim's passion is about returning equity to the shareholders. That's where his passion is. His passion is is about the quality of the business. His passion is about the brand. His passion is about doing things with integrity. His one of his major mottos is confronting reality that we're going to deal with the truth, and that's all we're going to deal with here. Um, and he, so he's a man of absolute, unwavering integrity. What you see is what you got. So most of the people who are interacting with him, there's no game going on. It is really about performance. If you're performing well, he's very easy to work for. But he's going to delegate ultimate authority. It is not about building, as I said, a love fest. It is about building a team of highly competent men and women who work together and are extre extremely competent in their own talents. So he hires very high talented people, lets them do their business, and pays them incredibly well. So if you perform, he is absolutely a wonderful human being to work for. If you want to get paid for effort versus results, you're in the wrong place. Um, he asked me at one point to work with the um, legal team. They have a very large legal team um, within, um, within Gillette. And there were a lot of, ups of upset attorneys about their bonuses and compensation. And what they were upset about was um, this argument of I've put a huge amount of hours in and I'm not getting a bonus. And if you remember his philosophy, it is not about effort. That's, that's, just, that's just your entry fee. It is about performance and the performance will be measured for every individual and every team. And so the performance is measured as a team, so there's a team part of it, and then there's individual performance. If you're not a high performer, you cannot work on, on Jim Kilt's team. 
So I don't know if I, if I answer the question about, you know, do they like him? They have every one of them has tremendous amount of respect for him. And then there is a mixed, actually, tomorrow, um, tomorrow? Saturday, um, I'm having dinner with his um, previous head of finance and Ned Gillette, his head, head of HR, and, and their chief operating officer. We're, we're getting together in Laguna Beach for just a little celebration. It's been a while since we've come together. These are high-performing people who have tremendous admiration for Jim Kiltz. You know, so you have to interpret you know, what the word like means. I mean, I'd much rather work for someone who I knew was going to be fair, straight, um, although, my, you know, I mean, I love working with him, you know, the walking heart. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, that's, that's the best I can do with that. that would that's be. okay. So, so, so doing what matters, if you have to pick off what matters most to Jim, what is it? Um, integrity, enthusiasm, and results. He works with a lot of consultants. Jim works with a lot of consultants. Jim, Jim, again, believes in using real high talent for very specific areas. So his whole philosophy about um, using outsiders is for very specific tasks and also to be managed tightly. Um, so again, he's always going after the best talent in every area, every problem, everything they're working on. So if it's inside or outside, but very clear expectations and very clear performance measures about when you work with him. So yes, he does extensively use McKinsey, Bain, I mean the larger consulting firms, and then, and then a few of us who know what we're talking about. That was so, humble. Uh, no, I understand. So, so, so I, I'm, sitting, I'm thinking about the people you know, sitting in the room. I, I read the book because I know and love you. Um, but, so you have a group of people from the business community sitting in the room. What, what, what would be the best thing that anybody in this room could take away from what you've learned working with Gillette and Jim Kiltz? Wow, great question, Mike. Um, I think it's back to what I started talking about. I mean, again, I'm going to take a baseline of high integrity, um, and, I, and, I've, and, and I strongly urge you to look at Jim's you know, content around confronting reality and how he does that. Um, I believe it is about having very clear expectations with everybody who works for you, that we both really understand what my task is, how I'm going to be evaluated, and how I'm going to be rewarded. And that's very clear when you work with Jim Kiltz. I think the second thing that Jim is um, very, very obsessive about, clear measures and good information. So we're in an age of huge um, technology advances. Um, and, I, and, and Jim's focus for the IT department in Gillette in Nabisco is what I want is the right information on a timely basis. I'm not looking for the fanciest system. I want my people throughout the world to get the right information at the right time to help them lead and manage their teams. So clear clear understanding of how we work together, clear sense of measures. And then the third piece for, you know, of, of the many things that I've watched Jim do so well is that everybody really understands the rewards and recognition that happens within this organization. And we will have a company of tremendous rewards, and we will celebrate, and we, we, we will recognize performance. And it's done at every single level in the organization. When, when, when Jim, when, this is a question I have just from listening to you. When, when Jim sat with his direct reports and uh, um, they would write what they thought their job was and he would write what their job was mm -hmm. and there was a difference, how did that play out? Um, it played out in terms of a dialogue of clearly defining what that is. What's on the list, what's off the list, that we're real clear what those things are and how those things are going to be evaluated. Was, it, was that a mutually decided upon? Mutually or was, decided upon. He, uh... mutually, but, however, mutually decided upon, but he's got some very clear focuses on what happens in marketing, okay? What happens in terms, of, and you know, and, and the other uh, piece that Jim, Jim so brilliant. What I'm trying to get at, was he the kind of person that would, would he break a tie? Absolutely. He, oh, totally. That was no, it, no, absolutely. It's my way or the highway. There are three, three, three ways that you make decisions, right? There's autocratic, consultative, and consensus. And most leaders, in my opinion, have to have the ability to move amongst those three. Autocratic is you're going to do what I tell you to do. Um, consultative is we're um, I'm going to listen to all your input, but then I'm going to decide. And consensus is we'll all decide together. One of the things that I think that Jim does so well is. The team knows that this decision is not 
a consensus decision. I'm making this decision. It's real clear. This is where we're all going. What's agreed upon on that team is everybody can, can weigh in. And even at the end of each meeting, what we do is everybody had one to three minutes to weigh in on, a, on, a, on an issue or what was happening. And then the decision's made. And your job as a part of that team is you support that decision, even if you didn't agree with it. And if you didn't, you weren't going to be able to stay in that team. Jim allows for mistakes. You just don't make the same mistake twice. I'm real clear about that. Um, but he, so he is, he's authoritative when he, when he believes he needs to be. And he's, in general, very consultative and really listens to the input of these very smart men and women that he has around him, which I encourage all of you to do. And I think makes, it's common sense organized, right? And that everybody does that. What's important is that I understand the process I'm in. If I think this is a consensus decision, the reality is it's not. Again, it's all done with integrity. And as I said, confronting reality. Here's where we are. Here's the situation. Here's how we're going to do this. So he's real clear about breaking ties to your question. All right. So when Gillette, when, it, when Gillette was packaged and sold to Procter & Gamble, what happened in Boston? <laughs> I'm sorry. Total disaster. Um, you know, people in Boston were very, very upset, you know, about a headquarters, you know, leaving. And they had lost some other Bank of America had left. I mean, so that there's, there's a huge... Um, um, uh, who was, who was in Boston? What was Bank of America? They bought by Bank of America. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They lost some headquarters. Uh, Jim was painted as a uh, evil, um, I mean, the articles in the papers were, had a lot more to do with his compensation um, and taking the company out of Boston. Boston, um, it was a very, very difficult time for Jim. In fact, the, the, uh, John Manfredi, who's our other co-author, uh, was his head of communications and underestimated the, 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 the power with which Boston was going to come after the company and, you know, for the sale um, of Gillette. So it was a very, very difficult time. Um, and I think Warren Buffett was a great um, coach for Jim during that time because uh, it gets real lonely when every time you open up the newspaper, like Alex Gonzalez. <laughs> uh, did I just say that? Um, it gets really, really lonely, um, I've, we feel. Alex is in our CEO group, so I, you know, yesterday's article. Um, it gets very, very lonely. And, the, you know, the, the nice part of, of this for Jim is the team rallied around, and Jim had tremendous support from the team, but it was very difficult in Boston. And the articles talk about how much money he made, you know, not the fact that $30 billion was returned to the shareholders. And that's one of our debates, too, because also a lot of people lost their jobs. And that's a, a point of... of discussion Mike and I have had on many occasions. I can <laughs> I certainly it. weigh in on that. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can, hey, I, but we're going to run out of time. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Shall I weigh in on that uh, or not? You're the boss. I, well, no, I'm not the boss, but, but I, this is a, pardon me for my personal uh, Go. Uh, a view on most of this. Go. I, I believe, this is probably a little too over the top, but I believe we in America have lost our corporate soul almost because one of the things that popped out and just jumped out at me, and I, I showed it to Bob when this happened, was you know, just, people make money. M money. The amount of money people make is one thing. But what happens to other people when they're making that money, I think that is the other thing. So what jumped out at me was that <clears throat> uh, Jim Kiltz did this great thing. He returned shareholder value, at least at $30 billion. He walked away with $170 million, something like $168 million. And in the article I read, it said, and only 6,000 people lost their job. And when I read only 6,000 people lose their job, and when I see how we in America, what's, what's been going on for a long time, ever since corporations have, you know, I work for a nonprofit corporation whose mission is to create jobs. So I come to work seriously, with a mindset of job creation and a mindset of how do you do all the things that Jim has to do and create jobs. Yeah. And I believe what happens on the other side of the coin is how do we make a lot of money and what doesn't get said in all of this, he's there for five years, I don't know that that's sustainable and I don't know how many people had their job at the beginning and how many people lost their job at the end. But I was absolutely captured by he's walking away with this and only I mean, we've gotten to a mentality as a society that only 6,000 people lost their job. And how many of us would want to be one of those 6,000 people? And how would we feel about having the company packaged like that? 
So that's what Bob and I talk about. I don't know if there's a clear answer to that. There's globalization, technology, financial markets is changing everything. But I think if you have a, a little bit of a different mindset as a society, you might have different outcomes and still make money, still have a good time. Does that make sense? Okay, so we won't debate about that right now. Well, it's not those, debate. It's, those who you want to stay. political statement from the morning. I, 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 what, if, <laughs> but I, I'm not saying anything's bad. No, I'm no, just no. saying I, I bet you there's a better way. If it's okay, I would like to just take a couple of minutes and show you a couple of slides, you know, Mike, because, you know, again, I want to be very, very respectful. Yeah. Pardon? Questions. Yeah. Um, I, 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 will, I won't take any questions. I just, I just want to go through... Um, I have, an, I have another book coming out, May 6th, write this down, this is what I'm very excited about. Um, the book is called, Who Are You and What Do You Want? And I am really excited about um, this book. Not that, you know, this book is really about Jim and real business. This is about personal leadership um, and life planning. And it's, it's uh, Meredith Publishing is printing it, it's, it's putting it out May 6th. Who are you, what do you want? But one of Jim's philosophies is, is right here. You know, find out what you like to do, do what you love. Steve and I were talking about this. Really find out what you love to do and then do it. So that is, um, um, Jim is a, a CEO that really, really looks at basics and fundamentals. Um, it's all right, Mike. Um, so when Mike asked me a couple, um, that question about what Jim's passion is, is if you go right there, he really, really focuses on choosing the right team and then focus on fundamentals. And we talked a little bit about leadership. What matters to him, very right up front, is confronting reality which is what's the reality of the Gillette situation? What was the reality of the Nabisco situation before he went in? So we can get the whole team focused on what is it we need to do and then how we're going to do it. So, oops, I'm losing my thingy here. Um, uh, <laughs> fundamentals, uh, um, intellectual integrity is about integrity and confronting reality. And he is, and as, you know, as Mike um, met Jim, and Jim is, as I said, fairly, you know, he's about six foot four, gray, very um, proper, very. Um, but he loves people who are enthusiastic about what they're doing. Absolutely loves enthusiasm and the right things matter, which again we've we've written about. Right team, um, yes, sir. What's the circle of doom? The circle of doom is. Um, <laughs> um, That's those six thousand employees. <laughs> It has to do with, with where money gets invested. And what happens is, as Jim looks at an organization, you go into a turnaround situation, what people begin to cut is the wrong things. One of the things that gets cut is the advertising and marketing budget. And that's a key part of that. And it's, it's you know, I'll show it to you. But it, it, it's really, are you cutting, are you focusing on what really is going to make a difference to the business? And he sees a cycle where people come in, begin to cut costs, and they're cutting the wrong costs. And that's what really it's all about. Um, nine factors that matter for success. You know, again, that's, that's um, fundamentals, which, which, which I've talked about. Um, Jim is really about keeping things simple. A, B, C. Here's, here's how we look at this. It's, it's, it's like strategic planning. You know what strategic planning is? Where are we now? Where do we want to be? And how are we going to get there? So this, the, the first phase is taking a real clear look at, at the, the, the situation, uh, and the analysis of where Gillette is. Second part is, where do we want to go? And then how's this team going to get us there? Um, fundamentals, which I talk about. Um, what, when, when he looks at turnaround companies, which I think every, every company is, you're always looking at how do you get better, which is, again, are we all doing the right stuff? Enthusiasm, taking action, everybody understands what the priorities are. Um, I mentioned intellectual enthusiasm, there's details. Um, this is Ross Perot. Um, where I come from, if you see a snake, you kill it. Have, um, at, at Gillette, what he saw was here, you appoint a committee on snakes, and then you hire a consultant on snakes. So it's like, again, he wants to keep it simple, and where, where, which you gotta work. Um, uh, again, these are all in the book. The right team, as I mentioned to you, Jim is obsessive about putting the right team together, and then having a real strong succession plan that as we move people around and develop people, Jim is obsessed about developing people. Huge amount of effort going into uh, the area that Joan works in, which is you know, organizational effectiveness, that we really are going to develop our people. It's not just cross your arms and see how they're doing. Our responsibility is to help people be successful. Um, so bench strength is critical. Um, talked about the right team. Um, Jim's process, you know, as you look at your own companies, is there is a staff meeting every week, and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you will participate in that meeting. You'll call in if you're in Australia, but that team meets every week. 
Then he's got quarterly priorities, which I talked about, and there's quarterly offsites. And the offsites are not only to look at data, which everybody reviews the important priorities and what they're working on, but it's also about the team spending time together. Um, annual objectives, you know, which are, here's your circle of doom, um, which is, um, you know, they increase prices, cut marketing, uh, trade loading is basically at the end of the month, you know, sending all this product to your customer and then they're stuck with all the, he eliminated that right away, huge cost of Gillette. Um, so it's, it's unrealistic objectives, building overhead capital, sales short for increased prices, cut marketing, that's, you know, that's what he went after to change. Um, avoiding the circle, here's, here's what he did in terms of avoiding it. Real growth, um, control costs, Zog is what he calls zero overhead growth, key measures, focus on market share, and invest in marketing. Um, so if you're a brand, you know, if you've got a brand, you can't have, you, you've got to have your, your name out there. You know, you open up a newspaper every week and you're going to see Ace Hardware. Excuse me, Davis Lumber and Hardware. <laughs> I'm still from the old days. <laughs> it's okay to say Ace. Um, uh, day one which I mentioned to you, you know, Jim had a 100-day plan. There's a book out called The 90-Day Plan. From day one, confront reality, clear description of him as a leader, what his philosophy, his expectations, and then their operating model, and I know him at 9 o'clock, and Mike said, you know, we would take a couple of questions if you want to stay, is having a, a very straightforward strategic plan, an operating plan. Every single, every single executive had a, uh, annual objectives. They're reviewed quarterly. And everybody's very clear about the rewards and recognition tied to these plans and these processes. And each individual plan tied into the overall, overall strategic plan. Uh, Joe and I just met with the head of strategy from Gillette, and that's how he lays it out in every single organization. And again, Jim relies on incredibly competent, talented people like Peter Klein, who was head of strategy, who helped him put this together. Day one matters, and I think I'll just kind of leave it, um, I'll leave it there. Um, which is from the very first moment you walk in the door. And one of the things, you know, what, where I learned about that was from actually from Larry Bossidy. I worked at Allied Signal many, many years ago. One of the things that Larry said was, um, every time a new executive, man or woman, walks into a new team, it takes a huge amount of time for them to get to know each other and how we're going to work together. And Larry and Jim is, how do we expedite that? So the very first day a new leader walks in, we spend at least a half day, in most cases a whole day, with the team getting to know that leader. Not doing this over a six month to 12 month period of time. Um, so that's one of, another one of Jim's obsessions. Let, let's let's um, maybe take a couple questions, Mike, and you know, again, I want to be, uh, not from Mike Lyon. Anybody else have a question? Uh, no. <laughs> Mike, go ahead, I'm sorry. Recognition, monetary or non-monetary? Both. Both, which is weighted heavier? Uh, Both being mine. Well, my opinion about that, Mike, is um, the intangible is much more powerful. Now, a lot of people work for Jim because uh, there's huge rewards at the end of the day, but the reality about recognition is the tangible, the money, you can only, unless you're in sales, you can only do that so often. You know, so, so money is further away from when performance happens. So the day-to-day -day feedback and recognition is much more powerful than the tangible. Is it done really as in, uh, in front of the peer group or done with tiling or what's Both. Both. Um, and when you're, you're talking about consequences. So, so when people perform, after people perform, there's only three things that can happen, right? Something good, something bad, or nothing at all. Our job as parents and managers is to make sure, you know, what, what's our job? Is Our job is to make performance make a difference. So what we want to have happen is more good things are happening, more positive things are happening after performance. The second piece is how do you effectively correct? In this country, most feedback, most recognition is, is nothing happens at all. The only time something happens is when you screw up, right? So how do you indoctrinate within the system, which is all managers, all coaches are having some consciousness about the, using the data for feedback and recognition. And that is tied to the monetary aspect. But the real power is your personal attention. You know, if you're a manager, if you're a, you know, and, and you know, you look at your business and, you know, you've got real estate salespeople all over the, you know, scattered all over the, you know, Sacramento, which is the more feedback they get, the more information that lets them know that they're doing a good job, honest, sincere, based on data, has a huge impact on performance. Same thing with our kids, same in sports. Mike has one more follow-up and then I'll get to you. Culture was the second piece because when you hear someone that is so absolute and, um, yes. and I, I like the process, but how would you describe a culture? coming out of that? Or can he create a culture that's describable? 
Um, in, again, in, in, in a, you know, it's a whole conversation every day, uh, the culture within Gillette, um, as it was in Nabisco, is a culture of integrity, again, doing the right thing and doing what, ma what matters is Jim's title. It is for people to really understand what's important to us is doing the right thing and doing it with integrity. And that's a culture that got built within Gillette. The other, other part is tremendous pride in the product and the quality. So, you know, Gillette was brawn and Oral-B and, you know, the real heart of the company is the, is the blades. And, you know, they have, what do they have, 100 PhDs working on blade technology? You know, so, I mean, the passion for doing high-quality performance is a major part of the culture that everybody had a pride of what's going on. And the other thing about the culture is that there was an information flow, and Mattel is doing this in the middle of this crisis. Bob Eckert, who worked for Jim for many, many years, which is, how do we make sure all of our stakeholders and employees know what's going on before the public does? So a huge focus on internal communications for people to really feel like, this is my company. You know, that's what happens at Rayleigh's. You know, there's a tremendous effort that Joan and Bill and the senior team there work on making sure people know what's going on. I don't want to pick up the papers and read you know, that there's, you know, although Mattel's got some other complex issues, which is a whole other conversation, which is that there's a feeling of I am important within this company, and I make a difference. And I think that's one of the things that Jim communicates in that culture, that every single person makes a difference, and every single person matters, if that answers your question, Mike. You had a question, please. Uh, uh, yes? We spent a, a lot of time talking about the persona of Jim. Yes. Uh, he's uh, analytical, he's objective, he is a tax person, yes. he has his own inner drive. Yes. Um, but we always use the cliche among CEOs that it's lonely at the top. Yes. So was there a point in time in, this, in, in his relationship with Gillette yes. and the turnaround where he felt that he might not be going right, down the right direction? And how did he deal with that? Great question. Um, I th uh, and, and even within our CEO group, it, you know, we, we talk about this lonely at the top piece because who do you talk to? You know, who are your peers? Jim has um, two, two things. One is he's got a network of people like Warren Buffett that he bounces stuff off. So he doesn't stay, you know, my belief about him is as smart as he is, he's not walking around like I have all the answers. So as this, this process about this, this move with Lafley and Procter and & Gamble took a huge amount of time and a lot of soul searching in multiple ways, as you would imagine, for, for a person of integrity. The second thing that, that Jim has is he's got his own kitchen cabinet. There's a core group um, that have been with him for a long time. Um, the head of finance, Ned Gillette at um, HR, Peter Klein at Strategy, John Manfredi. So there, there's, a, there's a core group of people that um, he really could go offline with and say, am I crazy? You know, you know let's really, you know, so, so he has a network of a couple of CEOs, you know, Mr. Buffett's definitely been one that Jim has bounced off, and I know we're going to run out of time. So, um, my gosh, I could do this all morning, and I love him, and I, I so appreciate your coming this morning. I know that, and, I, and, and those of you who want to chat some more, uh, there's so much to talk about. I hope you get a chance to, you know, buy one book and pass it around. Um, you know, I, I do on a third. Um, and May 6th, who are you and what do you want? Anyway, God bless, and thanks for coming, and Michael, thank you. Thank you.